Uh, I would like to bring out our next panelist. Why don't you come out, and I'll give you uh, brief introductions uh, uh, while they're coming out. The first two panelists are Jeff and Krista Dugan, who've started the company Portola Coffee Lab, uh, which has a store in Orange County. Uh, it is a roasting company, so it also supplies beans to um, uh, restaurants. And then the, the second two are brothers Roland and Christian Navarro, who started a uh, company that almost, they, they have to explain it because I couldn't uh, <laughs> adequately explain it at all, uh, HelloFresh. And why don't we start with, uh, start with you guys? I'll, I'll start with you, uh, uh, Roland, and then get to Christian. Sure, so hey guys, what's up? Wow. Uh, so basically, HelloFresh, uh, we strive to be the most compassionate culinary experience company in the world. Uh, we specialize in catering and food experiences that uh, give back to the community. Yeah, um, food is what we, uh, what we make, what we serve, um, but at the heart of it was sharing love. I can't write a song, I don't um, play the guitar, but what I do is I, I cook, and that's the way I show love, and that's um, what was at the heart of what we did, so. And you guys uh, are really using the internet and social media to pioneer a new kind of catering company and a new kind of restaurant. Describe uh, the concept of a pop-up restaurant. Yeah, a pop-up restaurant is where we'll find a, an a open space and, and come in, and it's a temporary restaurant, so we'll go into either someone's loft or a photo studio. We did that in London. We went to a photo studio, we set up uh, three days at a time, we'd put, make it into a restaurant and then leave. So we invade a space, put a restaurant, and then leave. And describe both of your backgrounds. Uh, we, we, we're, we, we're tight on time, but, but uh, give us your best uh, uh, thumbnail capsules of your careers and how you got into this unique space. Um, well, before I got into cooking, I was, uh, I was doing mortgages, and back then when it was easier to sell a mortgage than it was to get a cell phone. But, um, <laughs> Uh, but back, you mean back in the days when you said, uh, oh, what's your income, and they'd give it to you, and you'd say, you're yep. approved. Exactly. <laughs> um, I was doing that for a little while, and then um, back in that time, my dad was sick, and then when my dad, before he passed away, asked him what, what he wanted me to do, and he just said he wanted me to be happy, and that's when I went into cooking. So. And, and the... <laughs> it wasn't only that, though. Um, you, uh, you had to uh, confront some addiction. Uh, what, I beg your pardon? You, had to con you, you, you decided to confront your addiction. Oh, yeah, there was a lot of things. That, uh, uh, when, you, when you work in a uh, kitchen, you work in environments, um, people work hard, but they also do this thing where they play hard, so I, did, I was drinking a lot. And it wasn't until I got sober um, in which my life transformed, and I was able to follow, uh, or live a life that I know I could. So following my dreams, moreover, I guess, so. so. So your dad really lit the fuse, but then you still had to do something about it in your personal life to make it truly come true. Absolutely, um, yeah, and when I look back at it, I didn't, it, I'm living the dream for, um, you know, living the dream, looking at it. Um, it's just been amazing since then. I got to see life with the lights on, so. And uh, Roland, explain the, the, the role that HelloFresh has in uh, do, making great food for people who can't afford great food. Yeah, so basically what happened was, um, when I talked with my brother, we had to say, what is our product? And it was love. And to do that, we built a model where we reinvest 10% uh, of our gross revenue back into local charities. And ever since we made that decision, actually today when we're doing uh, the appetizers, we're actually supporting an organization called Two Wings. Uh, the founder, basically they uh, educate and life coach uh, survivors of sex trafficking and things like that. And ever since we made that decision to give back, uh, the company has exploded, so yeah. Uh, one more question uh, I'll, for both of you, uh, and then I'll get, I'll get to the Dugans, but uh, why do you think, um, uh, in the book that I have coming out, uh, I, I discovered that love is one of the things that creates trust, deep teams, a great story, and other things that uh, enduring companies have, but why do you think so, 
Many people in uh, business are afraid to use the word love. Uh, I haven't seen a lot of business plans or even corporate uh, <laughs> mission statements with the word love in them. I think people might be afraid that um, finding strength and humility um, could be something, but um, love is something that seems soft. No one, but rarely is it looked at something that is like something that's powerful, something that moves mountains. And I think that's what moved me um, from, from certain dark places, um, that you can always be redeemed from wherever you are if you come from love. Because there's places where I've been so dark, it was someone that loved me, my brother, um, my mom, a chef that I was working for that pulled me out of the dark place in which I stepped into when I got into my sobriety. Someone had to love me. And I think um, it's not talked about in, in, um, in, that, in that context, in that way. So. Now, you don't see too many corporate quarterly statements with that word in it, but... Uh, well, let's move to the Dugans. Um, uh, Portola Coffee Lab, um, tell me what you do, and uh, tell, me why, tell me why the coffee market isn't crowded now, because it seems, uh, you know, with a Starbucks on every street and, and with local competitors, you know, up where I live, uh, across the street from uh, Menlo Park Presbyterian, you can find an MPPC pastor at any hour of the day, really, at Pete's uh, across, the, across the street. Um, and, yet, uh, and yet you see this new wave of uh, cutting-edge uh, coffee and roasting companies. To, uh, tell us about the market and what you saw and, and your own motivations uh, to do this. Um, yeah, so uh, many people would say that the coffee industry is... is, is pretty played out, or pretty dense, um, highly competitive, and I, I would disagree with that in the sense that um, there's a lot of aspects about coffee that uh, just haven't been explored, and I think coffee has been looked at generically for, uh, well, for since its, its birth um, a long time ago. Um, so what we've, what we've done is, is taken the approach that coffee is, is culinary, and our approach to coffee is looking at quality across the entire spectrum from uh, the seed that grows, the shrub that produces the fruit, all the way to how it's processed, um, how we roast it, and also how we brew it and serve it. And not compromising, or trying our best not to compromise uh, anywhere along that route. So the experience that a customer has in our shop is going to be quite different than they would have at the big chain stores like Starbucks and some of the others without naming specifics, but so it, we're targeting a specific market. We're not trying to compete with Starbucks. Uh, there's people that are going to continue to buy their Starbucks coffee, and that's fine. It's a, it's a flavor preference. It's a style of coffee that they prefer. We're just catering to a different crowd and providing a very unique product in that sense. Well, it's amazing how fat this coffee connoisseurship in the United States, how rapidly it's happened. I mean, from... Uh, you know, the 1970s, people's idea of a, a cup of coffee was uh, a inst cup of instant coffee. Um, Starbucks really raised, raised the expectations, I think. Uh, and Howard Schultz, uh, who grew up in the projects in, in, uh, in, out in the outer boroughs in New York City, was really an inspirational story himself, inspired by the Italian coffee house experience and bringing it to the United States. But now, uh, Chris, everybody has an expectation that coffee is going to be is going to be great. Uh, how do you stand out when everybody has that expectation? Well, I think especially opening up in Orange County, that was a big um, issue that we had to discuss when we were planning our business. Was how were we going to stand out? What could we do that was going to be different? And if you come into our shop, our we are so passionate about coffee. Our baristas are extremely passionate about coffee, too. And we make sure we hire people that, that can show the same type of passion that we have because we can't be there every day. So we need to be able to show the customer that everybody in our shop has that uh, commitment to, to the passion. Yeah, there's uh, up in the Bay Area, in, in around Palo Alto, there's a new company called Phil's. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden... Uh, Phil's has become the new hot brand, and it only has seven stores. And how can uh, the both of you, and then I'm going to ask uh, the Navarros too, when you have, uh, you, build a, you build a brand on connoisseurship and passion and love and all those intangible things, can you scale that? 
I mean, how, uh, how, what, what are your own expectations about how far you can take that into the marketplace? How do, how do the two of you, the, the two Dugans, think about growth and scale and what would be too far and what would be not enough? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question and something that we think about every day. Um, in the coffee industry, we're dealing with a commodity. It's an agricultural product, and there is a limited supply of coffee, period, every year. Uh, for us, the way that we source, we're probably, I don't know what the percentage is, but it's, it's absolutely less than probably a tenth of a percent of the coffee that we're targeting. Um, I personally travel all over the world to Africa, South America, Central America, and purchase my coffee directly from the producers and establish relationships with those farmers for a lot of reasons. But um, in terms of... Well, let's just stop there because, and then I'll let you keep it, but th that in itself is really one of your differentiating factors, right? And we were talking backstage how, you know, in, in, a, in a giving economy, uh, you're giving them advice and they're giving you some of their best beans. I mean, uh, yeah, and, and you're building trust. It's really a trust-based relationship. Right. Uh, we do set out to set out to establish relationships and have relationships with farmers all over the world. And um, we've even gone so far as to establish an organization called Roasters United. It's myself, Mike Perry from Clatch, and uh, Chuck from uh, Bird Rock Coffee Roasters down in San Diego. And we formed this organization um, primarily to improve sustainability. And, and in our mind, sustainability is is making sure that the farmers. Um, can continue to grow coffee year after year. So I could throw a bunch of money at them to get them by that year, but if I'm not fixing problems and encouraging them to focus on quality, uh, it's going to be short-lived. So part of this program is, is incentive-based. Um, you know, we're providing money to encourage them to grow better coffee, and we'll pay a higher price for that. We also provide cash awards to the top three, so it's makes, um, it, it creates a competitive market amongst the farmers. And we did it in Colombia. Uh, we just finished it a couple months ago, and it was, we had great success. Um, it was our first year doing it with this farmer, our group of farmers, who are excited about next year because the money that we gave them, we do, we do mandate that it goes towards uh, farm improvement because, again, quality equals price. And if they're going to thrive in, um, in an industry where the market is very volatile, quality trumps the market. So in other words, there's such a small percentage of really high-end specialty coffee out there that if if these farmers get elevate their coffee to that level, the market doesn't matter because there will be a buyer for that coffee and they'll get whatever price they want for it. So back to the question on scale, uh, Krista, there, uh, if you want um, what Jeff described as <clears throat> a tenth of 1% of the market, it's still a fairly big market, um, and enough mar it's enough of a market for you to be a sustainable business yourself. What, where do you think you'll settle upon on the scale issue? And then I'm going to ask the Navarros the same thing. Well, this year is our year of growth. We have two new shops opening this year that we're really excited about. But we struggle with that question every day. We'll sit at the dinner table. And you know, as an entrepreneur, we have tons of entrepreneurs in the audience. I mean, there is sort of um, a balance. Where do you go from there? Do you, do you grow and, and open 20 new stores in the next three to five years because you got this great investor? Or do you hold on, hold tight, um, grow slowly, and just continue on your path and don't compromise your values whatsoever? So, I mean, we're constantly struggling with that. We've chosen the slow method. Um, that might not be right for everybody, but I think in the end, it's going to be right for us. Uh, to the Navarros, one of the people I profiled in my um, uh, book, The Soft Edge, is David Chang of the Momofuku noodle bar fame and television fame. And he grew up uh, a Korean American, grew up in suburban DC. His big passion in high school was to be Tiger Woods. Uh, but there, uh, God didn't make too many Tiger Woods, and he was not one of them. <laughs> so he went into his second area of passion, which is food. He, uh, he uh, trained at some uh, well-known, very expensive New York five-star restaurants. But it was a trip to Tokyo and working in the back street noodle bars of Tokyo that really his revelation came. And that was is that good food can be affordable for everyone. Um, talk about uh, your, well, you talked about your re revelation, but the everyone was what was interesting. Can HelloFresh scale to be for everyone, or is it a, inherently a concept 
that is local in nature with pop-up restaurants and so forth? Um, I, the way I kind of look at it um, is I think we're, we're in the business of also in changing the culture. Um, one of the big things that, that drives me is changing the, the culture of the dinner table. Um, but I think we stay relevant to culture, so um, as we apply our hearts to what currently happens, um, whether it's the pop-up restaurant right now, we can scale that now. Um, but there's also different concepts. We're starting a new fundraising platform which uses supper parties to help um, fund uh, different nonprofits. So by bringing people together um, over dinner parties, we can do that. So as many uh, nonprofits that want to find uh, who want to host a supper club um, is also another thing. Um, my brother is the tech entrepreneur. I'm the cook, so I think you might be yeah. better equipped. Yeah, so uh, one of the things that we really focus on is uh, it's almost like we're a, a venture culinary company. So, like for example, one of our biggest scales was um, movie sets. And when we were doing these types of craft service, it was basically how do you systematize to a degree? There's a balance by creating a system, but then filling it with passionate people that will not ruin the brand. So I remember when we were hiring chefs, and we had a chance to hire a Michelin uh, starred kind of experienced chef five-star whole thing, we actually ended up hiring uh, one of our good friends from junior high who's so passionate about loving and giving back that we were able to build a system but insert him into the proof of concept and then we just kind of rinse and repeat that model. And, you know, it's been pretty good. So I think that's one of the things is really finding a balance and finding a system that works while not straying too far away from your brand. Well, I also want to tie what you're doing in just a couple of minutes we have left, um, the uh, Ariana's talk uh, and uh, Pastor Rick's book, The Daniel Plan, that street food and, and uh, native cultural food and all of that kind of stuff, maybe in the past, at least in the United States, incarnation of it, uh, hasn't had the best reputation for um, healthful uh, but you're really changing that. And one of your missions is to have really good, affordable, healthy food uh, available for everyone. Yeah, I love, one of my favorite things to do is to trick people into eating healthy. So when I like make oh, a kill please, you know, for those of us who have teenagers, you've got to give us the code on that. Oh, well, most of the times it's just like good ingredients, a little salt and pepper, and just... Um, but it's interesting because when I do a set, I was doing um, a set for Demi Lovato on her last tour, and um, it was just so funny because like I would, uh, if you if I take something and I call it roasted carrots, turnips, uh, parsnips, um, they won't eat it. But if I call it roasted roots, people love it. So uh, it was it's just interesting. So um, just paying a little bit more attention to to the way you you treat the um, the product. I don't know. So. I didn't think I'd like cauliflower until I had it served as mashed potatoes, what I thought was mashed potatoes. But. And just so you know, coffee, just by itself, if you try it black, has no calories. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, we're heading. <laughs> You're persuading to, me to give up my uh, five-hour energy habit here and, uh, and get back to real natural caffeine. Um, we're heading into the lunchtime. Uh, let's give our panelists a big hand.